Next up, we have Sherry Fernandez Williams. Uh, Sherry Fernandez Williams holds an MFA in writing from Hamlin University and is a recipient of an Artist Initiative Award through the Minnesota State's Art Board, a SACE Jerome Award. Do you say SACE or SAC? SASE. SASE? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> SASE. A SASE Jerome, uh, Jerome Award through Intermediate Arts and the Jones Commission Award through the Playwright Center. She was a selected participant in the Loft Mentor Series for Creative Nonfiction and the Givens Black Writers Collaborative. Her work has been published in, variety, in various literary magazines and anthologies. Her, um, this fly has kind of been around. I appreciate his enthusiasm for uh, literature. Um, a little intimate though. Anyway, uh, her work has been published in various literary magazines and anthologies. Her upcoming memoir, Soft, will be available in September of 2014. Fernandez Williams discovered her need for words in Brooklyn, New York, where she was born and raised, but grew up as a writer in the Twin Cities. Please welcome Sherry. between what I was going to read just now and as I saw her sweet little child. <laughs> so didn't want to corrupt her too much. <laughs> um, so my book is available now, Soft, um, published by North Star Press in St. Cloud. Um, and I will read, um, I, I've been saying uh, basically it's a story of um, um, a vulnerability of being vulnerable in a world that um, is kind of forcing us to be hard. Um, and so, um, soft is the anti-hard. <laughs> okay. And um, um, there are many threads in the book. Um, and uh, one of the threads um, has to do with my, uh, my previous marriage. And I'm just gonna give you a little snippet of what that was like. Great fun. Not so much. Okay. <laughs> Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. I felt the November bite, pulling myself out of the car, grunting a bit as I usually did when I exited a car because of my raggedy knee joints. At the time, I was a fat girl selling out for skinny and a thin leather jacket and smaller clothes to fit my smaller body at 36 pounds down that would rapidly diminish to 50, 60 to an ultimate 70 pounds less of me. You think that 36 pounds would have been something to celebrate for one who was losing weight after so many aborted attempts. After succumbing to the notion that weight loss would change my life. My life had changed for certain. I was bug-eyed with exhaustion and always so massively hungry. Knowing that if I could withstand the physical ache of hunger each day, parts of me would continue to vanish. And that was the idea, really, to vanish. I was a new mother of children who needed me to be awake when all I wanted to do was sleep. I begged the children to sleep at night and did everything I knew how to promote sensations of calm and quiet in those squirmy, undeveloped muscles of theirs. The warm bath, the bedtime stories about little farm animals on cruise liners um, held little appeal. The moon is high, the sea is deep. They rock and rock and rock to sleep, I read. I sing songs about Jesus, sing songs about love and mothers loving their babies and all the crap I'm gonna buy them if they hush and keep their tender little asses in bed. <laughs> I yearned for sleep, but they would not let me. Doing what two-year-olds do, diamond rings and looking glasses held no appeal for my twins. I yearned for sleep, but my dearly beloved's absence kept me awake, coming in all hours of the night with new excuses each day for why I heard him climbing the stairs at two or three in the morning. And I was a new mother. I could see their faces and compact bodies. They were right there in front of me, within my reach. I knew I could, they could see me too. They called out to me, mommy. But I was as mentally engaged as a single cell organism. I was not with them in real time, though many times I could try to shake it off, drink cold water, and take deep, deep breaths to snap out of the perpetual state of lightheadedness. Even from that remote place, I could foretell my future regret about this present debacle, my failing as a mother. What was all of that longing about? I questioned myself. I wanted this. I prayed for this. Greg and I bought a house 
on the dead end road one block away from the cemetery in order to have that large backyard where we could have a picnic outside like I'd seen those families do on TV all of my freaking childhood. I picked out the patio furniture and Greg purchased the grill. This would be our first evening without our children. The twins stayed home with my friend who had come to babysit. I'm not used to seeing you like this, he said to me as we walked toward the entrance of our neighborhood, TGI Fridays. Like what? You know, so slender. I walked several feet ahead of him because I was cold and needed to feel warm again. He walked as if he weighed 5,000 pounds, hunched over, hands shoved into his pockets. I was happier when I was fat, happy with my fat, fat and happy, even naked, even viewing the rolls of fat at my gut. Some people are bigger, some people are smaller. I was one of the bigger. And when I wanted to feel overtly delicious, I thought I could. My mother once pulled tight bell bottoms over her big behind to stroll down Fulton Street, and the men would fix their eyes on her like she was the damn sunset. But who was I to Greg on this November evening? I wasn't the sunset, the moonlight, a flickering star twinkling in the darkened sky. Hell, I wasn't even a GE 60 watt light bulb. In my natural way of being, I wasn't externally oriented. I never had the energy to be terribly concerned with the superficial. My riches existed within my internal life, and so my fat on most days went unnoticed by me, except when being exposed to my husband's wandering eye. His eye did not wander toward my likeness. His eyes wandered toward a smaller version of thickness, like the version I happened to be that night at TGI Fridays. Only he stopped seeing me for so long, I wondered if he'd forgotten I was there. So there we were, sit, sitting and waiting for the cheese sticks, and I threw it out right away, not wanting to waste another second. Where do you go at night? Out. Out to bars? Sometimes. To pick up women? No. He sat with his face twisted in knots. He was being uh, tight-lipped and stingy with his words, as he had been with his affection for so many months. He needed encouragement to talk, and so that's what I had to do. You know, I said to him, if our marriage ended, I think I should go for a more sensitive person the next time around. Mm -hmm. Just think about it for a moment. If you were set free from all of this, free from me, what would the next woman be like? She would be tall, he said. And I felt slightly relieved because at five foot seven and three quarter inches, I was taller than the average woman. But before I could respond, he clarified his meaning. You're tall, but not that tall, he said. Well, how tall do you have to be to keep a husband these days? <laughs> I was no streep in that movie she starred in with Jack Nicholson. Jack was sleeping with a 10-foot woman, and Meryl was pregnant with her first baby. In the end, Meryl hopped a plane to start her new life with her new baby away from the man who betrayed her. But how would my story end? And who could think of such things when, the pro when we're in the process of icing over from the inside out? What else would she be? Asking like a greedy masochist. Assertive and spontaneous, he answered without hesitation. Well, I was no more assertive than my husband was emotionally expressive. <laughs> I was a squirrel dodging shadows and footsteps. And as for spontaneity, preparation was vital to one's own sanity. It wasn't sexy, but it was the truth. And it used to be his truth, since when did he grow a need for spontaneity? Are you seeing someone, I asked? No, Sherry, he said with his eyes still on the table, not on his wife, his wife who used to mean something to him. This guy was gonna sit there and lie to me all night. Haven't I been good to you? I continued like a Motown record. He agreed I had. Then I deserved the truth, and the truth was what I got. He was seeing a 10-foot woman who was all assertive, <laughs> like a warrior woman from another planet flying to Vegas on winds, on a whim for all kinds of spontaneous adventures. How was I going to compete with that? He met her in June, the week of my 32nd birthday. This was weeks before we had even learned about the twins. Why, I asked. I don't know, Sherry, was his response. No, sorry. No, I was an idiot. Please forgive me. I watched him bemoaning the loss of his girlfriend who dumped his pimply behind after finding out that he was married. There was no feeling for me that I could detect, no attempt at damage control, and I had to witness this, his torture. What about my torture? Why did you go through with the adoption? 
because I was ready to become a father, he said. And I prayed for the spirit of peace to consume me because I was ready to take hold of the steak knife. Suddenly, I found myself displaced without a home in the Thomas More sense. The former Catholic monk I enjoyed reading who said that wholeness, security, belonging, placement, family, protection, memory, and personal history. Now I was homeless and a new mother of twins. And I was in the midst of planning this kitty birthday party. Why couldn't I have become a monk instead of a wife and mother? I could have written books with titles like The Reenchantment with Everyday Life and written essays about the significance of gardens but instead, I was coughing up the thorny stubs of rejection. This was not me. I ordinarily didn't use words like motherfucker because I was, you know, the church type and pacifist and a new mother who honestly tried to entertain thoughts of higher virtues, who loved the proverb that says, those who plan for good find love and faithfulness. And that is what I had done for so many years, planned for good, and I wanted to be good but yet there I was sitting in a family friendly restaurant and motherfucker was the only word that cycled through my consciousness. I formed a smile and folded my hands to keep them warm, something he used to do. I forced my psyche to move in the direction of finding good. Everyone had to coexist with tragedy every now and again. I demanded my legs, which had become blocks of ice to pull my body up. I left the restaurant still hungry and still feeling as if I had been abruptly dropped from the sky onto a glacier once known as home. Thank you. Wow.